sort of frame it in terms of two very important individuals, uh, Francesco Petrarca, and the other one is Baldassare Castiglione. Uh, they sort of, um, one we can articulate or see as the beginning of the Italian Renaissance, and the other I think we would frame him as the height, or a figure that represents the height of the Italian Renaissance. And I want to frame it in terms of these two people, because if you talk in just general terms, I think you lose people very quickly. If I just sort of in an abstract sense explain what humanism is, but I think if I root it concretely in these people, it'll be something of a help uh, to do so. But before we get going, it might be just helpful to just throw out, uh, for me at least, some idea of what you think Renaissance is all about. Uh, just, just thoughts, even names of famous Renaissance people. Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, certainly. Okay. What's that? The Medici. The Medici, yes. The Medici, yes. They were the great patrons of Florence. Uh, also, one becomes the great, um, well, two actually, the great patrons of popes in Rome. Other names. Raphael. Raphael. In fact, this is a painting by Raphael. We'll, we'll look at a couple of things by him later. Other names. Erasmus. What's that? Erasmus. Erasmus, certainly. Northern uh, uh, Europe, the most famous humanist of them all. Any other thing come to mind? Michelangelo, absolutely. Okay, so um, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Bonacaccio, these sorts of names come out, Bonacaccio, uh, Giotto, and writers. Might anybody think of a writer? Because most people, uh, certainly Italian writers probably don't come to mind, maybe, but Cassioni Petrarca I've already mentioned too, but uh, in Northern Italy, somebody, anything, besides the rest. Machiavelli. Machiavelli, certainly, absolutely. Machiavelli, these are sort of characteristic figures of the of uh, the great Italian Renaissance, and Machiavelli being right in the smack of the, the height of the Italian Renaissance, which sort of peaks, most people think, around 15, 20. Okay, the word Renaissance, though. What does Renaissance conjure up for you? Rebirth. Rebirth, rebirth. absolutely. Rebirth, <laughs> knowledge. Rebirth in particular of? Greek and Roman. Classical. Greek and Roman classical antiquity. Okay, now one of the things that um, historians, well, medievalists, my colleagues and medievalists, uh, sort of cringe at this when they, because um, there have been all along various rebirths of classical antiquity all along the way, all the way through the Middle Ages. It's not as if all of a sudden they came along and they discovered uh, Virgil. Virgil is the guy for Dante's Divine Comedy, right? Uh, they certainly didn't discover Cicero, but they did discover, and this is very important, <coughs> certain materials that hadn't been discovered before. They weren't aware of them. So Cicero in particular, certain aspects of Cicero we'll see was, were discovered and what Cicero represents for them. Um, they also, in the Middle Ages, really didn't understand Greek. That only begins to take place in the 15th century, a beginning in Florence, and that's a very important feature of the Italian Renaissance. Petrarca, for example, the, who we'll see is the first great humanist of them all, um, didn't understand Greek, but he kept his homer uh, with him uh, in Greek nonetheless. They only begin to understand Greek with the fall of Constantinople because you have all these Byzantine Greek scholars <coughs> coming across and then finding work um, in the 15th century. By the 16th century, if you did not know Greek, you really weren't going to be able to be considered a humanist. So it's Latin and Greek are fundamental. But more fundamental, and this is the argument of Panofsky, and these are very general terms, is there had been lots of renaissances. There had been the Carolinian renaissance. There had been all kinds of different renaissances. What's unique, in a sense, about what takes place in Italy, arguably, um, is that they begin to inhabit the spirit of that classical period. They really begin to understand what animated those works of art or those writings. So let me give you an example of this in a certain sense. In the, in the medieval period, you go around Rome. And what was Rome? Rome was just a lot of ruins. It was demolished. And I'll give you a sort of idea of this a picture. And what they would do is they would find, I don't know, a column here, a column there, and you want to build a church, you build it with the existing columns. They had lost in the Middle Ages both a uh, couple of capacities. One was to carve very well and make columns. And the other was even to make bricks. So you see in the Middle Ages all these buildings, which are sort of, you know, uh, hiddly piddly sort of jerry-built fashion, put together, beautiful works of art, but put together with the materials of classical culture. <coughs> but they don't really understand what animated, architecturally at least, 
that space, what it was that they were doing. It's not until you get to Brunelleschi and Michelangelo and these figures of the 15th century that they begin to look and understand what are the proportions, what are mathematically what's going on, what is the shape of things of this sort. And at that point, therefore, when you look at the Italian Renaissance, the buildings of the Italian Renaissance, what you find magically is they're no longer using the materials. They don't need the materials. They can now construct them for themselves. But what they do is they fashion things with the kind of rhythms, the kind of modalities, the kinds of shapes and structures and forms that existed earlier with their own materials. And so one of the things that starts to take place in the Italian Renaissance is they begin to inhabit spiritually, understanding what it was that animated the force to create those great works of art, such as, well, the, perhaps one of the greatest works uh, that was extant and still survived in Rome was the Pantheon. In fact, uh, uh, St. Peter's uh, Alberti, Leon Battista Alberti, had the idea that was later picked up by Michelangelo, is what did they want to do to create the Vatican when they rebuilt St. Peter's, is to take uh, the Basilica of Constantine and uh, Maxentius, which is the enormous <coughs> ruin basilica in the largest one in the Roman Forum, and put on top of it the dome conceptually of the Pantheon. So it's, it's not just you know, mixing and matching, it's really the understanding what it was. And they're doing this verbally as well, not just visually. So that's one thing I just wanted to start off on. It's, it's a renaissance of understanding from within. And one of the things I just wanted to throw out, this is a blurred map, unfortunately, but this is the state of things in Europe at the time. You can see we have these large <laughs> kingdoms that are starting to take place in roughly the year 1400. And of course, you've got the Ottomans over here who are going to wreak havoc in the 15th and the in the 16th century. But notice what Italy is made up of. Italy is fragmented. Italy is intensely fragmented. And that is one of the things that occurs in the Middle Ages, is you have, starting around the 11th century, after the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 and all that, um, as people moved away from these large centers like, um, like Rome, they moved and they inhabited small villages and hilltops. But there starts to take place in the 11th century a process of urbanization, extremely important, competitive, mercantile, organization, and competition. With great deal of movement of commerce, all the way from England, all the way, of course, uh, eventually with Marco Polo over to China and Asia and all kinds of things. That's a, so there's a great deal of mercantile movement uh, and wealth. But it's pocketed in city-states, in communes. And these city-states are vying with competition among one another. Eventually, that fuels the Renaissance. That fuels the Renaissance insofar as the competition among city-states eventually becomes competitions among these states themselves, these sort of fragmented entities. And they start to construct works of art in competition with one another. And they start to construct works of art in competition within the cities themselves. Perhaps the most famous example of that were the doors of the Florentine Baptistry in, uh, in Florence, where there was a direct competition. But there are other forms of competition, perhaps most famously as well, uh, Michelangelo uh, is set directly in competition with other artists in the Vatican at the very same time. So you have Raphael, Michelangelo, and Bramante, these three great artists competing amongst themselves is who is going to be the greatest. And sometimes someone, someone such as Julius II, the great pope who was the patron of Michelangelo, would organize a room such as his Stanza della Segnatura, which was his personal library. And he'd bring in four artists at the same time. And he'd have them competing, essentially, with the different walls. And finally said, no, I like that person the best. And he'd kick out all the others. And he'd give it to Raphael. And Raphael then composes the entire work. So you have this rivalry, this emulation. And this rivalry fuels the Italian Renaissance. Rivalries among city-states, rivalries among dukedoms, rivalries, the kinds of rivalries you might have in well, New York versus San Francisco, I don't know. Um, but rivalries in which is the better place to be. Uh, so much so that they start building massive cathedrals. The cathedral in Florence, one of the wonderful things about it, they start building the cathedral in Florence. But um, so big with this octagonal drum opening, they did not know how to cover it. 
They had absolutely no idea. And it was raining through in the middle, and all of a sudden comes along a man named Lulesky, and he says, I can do it. But imagine the audacity of these people, the boldness of these people to construct something that they knew would have to be freestanding suspended dome. They weren't going to just cover it over. Um, and they knew that somehow ingeniously they would do it, because through competition they could sort of arrive uh, at some kind of solution. So we have these competitions among themselves, both artists among themselves, but also a competition with the classical past. I think that's an important notion. That is to say, one thing is to imitate people. Another thing is to emulate them, to come up in um, conscious rivalry so that you are going to surpass them. Edmund Spencer, the great poet of the Fairy Queen, and Shakespeare as well, and Milton, to be sure, later in, to, to move ahead to England, which is a later Renaissance, um, they talk about overgoing is the word that Spencer uses. And Milton uses the same vocabulary, saying he will do things in his poem never before said in rhyme or prose. And the very moment he's doing that, he's copying a prior Italian author and engaging himself in a rivalry with those in the classical past. To be sure, with Milton, he's even engaging in a competition with God, but that's another story. OK, so what I wanted to do is just give you a sense of physically how fragmented were. And that fragmentation, I think, is important. Unlike the fragmentation today in Italy, which seems to be undermining the country constantly, but that's another story. OK, so what I want to do is start with this man, Francesco Petrarca. And I want to start with a date, which is April 8, 1941. I want to deal with a place, which is Rome, and more specifically, the Capitoline Hill, the Capitolio, which would have been, have been, from which we derive the term, a capital, our capital building. That was the most sacred spot in the Roman Forum on the other side. And this is eventually what it will become with, Bruno, with, with Michelangelo's design. It still extend today, roughly in the same design, the same shape with the Roman Forum behind. And what's important is at this time, Rome was abandoned. You have to imagine what a city like New York with what? 11 million inhabitants. Rome at its largest moment in the Roman Empire had been somewhere between one and two million people. By 1307, certainly by 1350, it was down to 17,000 people. Right? I mean, that's smaller than Georgetown. That's smaller than, what is it, H-U-T-T-O. I don't even know how to pronounce the term. Right? But it's really, it's a hot, I mean, it's, it's, Buda is larger. So just to give you a sense of what happened to this city, it had turned into ruins. So much so um, that it, you know, virtually you were walking around the forum and it was buried. It was underground constantly. Everything had still yet to be unearthed. And that's another way of thinking about the Renaissance, is they begin to literally unearth artifacts. There was a major moment in 1506 when they unearthed a sculpture that they had read about from Pliny's natural history. They unearthed this Laocoon, and then they go, oh my god, I'd read about it. And here it is, actually physically in space. But all in the Middle Ages, this stuff had just been underground. Not until fascism that they start to dig it up, unfortunately, in a terrible way. But um, nonetheless, if you have this sort of medieval vision of Rome, Rome was just simply these isolated monuments and where the capital line had been, where the most important part of the Roman Empire had been, was now completely abandoned. All this was just countryside. The capital line places becomes, in point of fact, known as Monte Capraio, because that's where the goats were. The, 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 the forum becomes uh, the pasture just for cow grazing. And you just walk through Rome uh, as if it were, I don't know, uh, the land of the apes, in a certain sense, mm -hmm. right? And quite literally, you know, instead of seeing the, um, the um, what, not the Eiffel Tower, the uh, Statue of Liberty, thank you, sort of half there, and uh, Charles has been screaming, you'd have the bed press screaming. But anyway, all that gets abandoned. And in that same time, all the aqueducts are constructed. Notice what they're, this is a map from that period, what, what they're isolating are just simply some of the extant monuments of the period, churches as well. And you would go on a pilgrimage there. Now, here's the Tybo River, here's the little, island in, in between, and here's the Vatican, which is walled uh, over here. Wait a second, no, here's the Vatican, it's walled, here's Castel Sant'Angelo. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so, one of the things that's important <coughs> is all of these aqueducts are now broken down. There's no water flowing into one million, two million people that had once been there. And that was one of the great inventions, 
right? The arch of the Roman Empire, bringing in water and doing all those sorts of things, creating these grand urban places. So uh, Seotonius will speak of, a, of, of the Emperor Augustus. He'll say he came and he found Rome made of brick and he transformed it all into marble. And he did. It was the most enormous building project of all times. And that extends all the way through the empire. Massive building projects, walling the Rome and all the rest of it. Well, where do you go if there's no more water? You go down to the river. This whole area here had once been called the Martian fields because it was the place where the marshes were. Was the, 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 the area of, of, of military exercises would be flooded all the time. So people have now huddled along the riverbanks, all along this area. So this is an abandoned space all of a sudden. And Petrarch, the, in April 8, 1341, he has himself <coughs> crowned Laurel Poet for the first time, he claims, in 1,300 years. Now, this is a very important moment because this really goes to the heart of a couple of things about the Italian Renaissance, it seems to me. First of all, Petrarch gets crowned Laurel Poet in 13, April 8, 1341, on Easter Sunday, without really having written much. And when people later discovered what he had written, he was supposedly writing this great epic poem called The Africa. They were really roundly disappointed in the kind of Latin that he had resuscitated, or thought he had resuscitated. Nonetheless, one of the things I think we can talk about Petrarch is he was the first PR man, at least the first PR man for the humanities, or academia, or something of that sort. Well, not academia, actually, because he purposely orchestrates this outside of the academic world. What he does is he orchestrates this. He's up in his, in his house in Vaucluse, up in, uh, up in northern, uh, northern Italy, southern uh, France, and he has this uh, event organized. He gets, he gets a letter, he says, wonders to behold, on the same precise day. One letter arrives in his country house from the University of Paris, offering to grant him the diploma and a laurel crown as the poet. The other one, he says, comes from the senators of Rome. And it's very important that he chooses Rome. It's very important because what he wants to do through this act of being crowned the laurel poet is, he claims, resuscitate, quite literally resurrect, a rebirth of classical antiquity. This is really a manifesto of the moment of the Italian Renaissance. Somebody goes to the Capitoline Hill. Everything is destroyed. He talks in other letters about walking around Rome. And he'll say, oh my god, this is where this was. This is where this was. But it's all buried underground. It's this sort of fantasy of somehow seeing the new Rome reborn in uh, the early, uh, in the mid uh, 14th century. So one of the things that's very important about him is he talks over and over about setting himself up as an example for others to follow. He also, for the first time, really articulates that there was a dramatic historical difference between the classical period and his own. That's extremely important for the Italian Renaissance, is to get a sense of histor historicizing things for the first time, being aware of a kind of separation between the classical period and one's own. And the other thing that I think is very important about this is that he made it all up. He orchestrated the <laughs> entire event. He wrote the diploma. Uh, he uh, orchestrated purposely that the, he would be invited by both places. Everything was invented. Petrarch is a perfect example of somebody in Erasmus's terms who was not born but made. This very notion of being able to fashion and consciously fashion his own identity. So he wrote more than anybody else of that period, to be sure. We know very little, to be sure, about who he really was and his life. So let me give you a couple of dates about Petrarch, just so we can start along our way. He was born in 1304. And his family moves to Avignon. Why would they be moving to Avignon at that point? But, you know, I was thinking about this earlier. Was he actually a Frenchman? I mean, no. Was he French or no. was he Tuscan? Okay. He's born in Arezzo. Okay. He's an Aretine. Uh, so he's Tuscan. Okay. But he's born <laughs> in Italy. But he moves at a very young age to Avignon. Now, what's going on in 1307, 13? The split of the church, the schism. Exactly. Well, we don't have the schism yet. The schism takes place a little later. But what happens is they move. It's what they call Dante and both Petrarch call the Babylonian captivity, where all of a sudden the papacy moves 
from Rome all the way up to Avignon. And it therefore is under the control, effectively, the political organization of the French king and monarchy and the rest. So it leaves Rome. And that's one more abandoning of Rome. Petrarch, by going and having himself crowned Laurel Poet, is constantly, he, Petrarch was just a, 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 an egotist to the nth degree. He's writing letters constantly to the Pope, telling him what he should be doing. <laughs> Not only is he writing to the Pope, he's writing to Cicero. He's writing to Quintilia. He's telling them about himself to these people and chiding them for being pagans. Not only that, but he's writing to you. He writes a letter to posterity. This is his obsession with fame. He's writing the letter to posterity, and it starts, perhaps some of you have heard of me. <laughs> right? And this is just this sort of um, suaveness, this nonchalance, in a sense, of being ever so important. And he knows he's that important. Everybody, in a sense, wanted to be near Petrarch. He had so many different patrons. But this consciousness of being important, but it's all very much orchestrated, very much fabricated, very much in control of the situation. So he's born in 1304. Family most talking to him because his father was a notary. Effectively, a, a notary is more than a notary here in the United States. <coughs> In Italy, still is today. He's kind of a lawyer, in a sense. And he moves up there because they have all kinds of bureaucrats and you know diplomats and all kinds of things. They need notarized. <coughs> he lives there. It's a very cosmopolitan sort of place in Avignon at that time. Very wealthy. And he's constantly railing against all the excesses of the church. He goes to Bologna to study. Why Bologna? Well, Bologna was the most important, oldest uh, university in Europe. It still is advised with Sorbonne for being the oldest. The Bologna is, like, I think, it's the oldest. Anyway, um, he goes there, and he's going there to study what? You study one of two things, either medicine or law. He goes there to study law. But he spends most of his time just having a good time, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, talking, uh, later he talks in his letter to posterity about how he was quaffing his hair and, you know, fixing himself and going out and writing poetry and all that stuff. And he doesn't study law. He writes poems. That's what he's spending most of his time doing. And that's very important, because Petrarch, is interested in something which in the classical period they would have called the trivium. That is grammar, rhetoric, and logic. He's not interested in logic, he care about it. He's interested in rhetoric, and he's interested in poetry. He wants to do trivial things, right? He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, studying law. He's writing poems, he's chasing after women. Um, and then he gets a reputation of being a good writer, and he finally enters into the service of Cardinal Colonna. This is a very important part of the Italian Renaissance, patronage. <laughs> patronage really begins in the Italian Renaissance. That is to say, you can get outside of a guild system by having directly a patron who's going to take care of you, right? Uh, the best I could do is find, get, my, get a job in academia. So, Petra, <laughs> in 1333, he's obsessed with the classical period. He really is. He talks about Virgil as if he's in a conversation. That's a very important aspect of the Italian Renaissance. He's in a conversation. Machiavelli has the same sort of feel. He talks in a letter about going on to the woods, getting himself dirty while he's in exile. This is in around 1513. But then he comes home and he puts on his white robe, his sort of toga, as it were. And he calls himself, I transfer myself into the past, and I have a conversation with the antiquity. So he really believes he's in great conscious uh, conversation with the classical period. But he's obsessed with finding books, finding things by Cicero that nobody's found before. Well, he discovers the Proarchia, and that partly inspires him, because it's defense of poetry, it inspires him to think about, huh, I want to be crowned a Laurel Poet. Thinking that there had been a crown laurel poet, he makes he, he mistakes. He, he doesn't. He's he's a good reader, but he's not a true classicist in the modern sense of the term. He doesn't understand yet really what's going on. Now, I've given you a letter to read in your packet, and you'll look at it. It's the climbing of Mont Ventoux. It's a letter that he that he puts into his collection of letters. I'll get that to that in a second. And he dates the climbing of Mont Ventoux to a certain day, but he, it's dated 1336. Not explicitly in the text, but you know that it is because he says ten, uh, 20 years before he leaves Bologna, and we know that he left Bologna in 1326. Anyway, the important thing is he talks about climbing his Mont Ventoux. I don't think he climbed it, but he talks about it. I think this is very important to bear in mind. Then he buys a house in Little Clues, and then he receives the offer to be crowned Laura Poet, something that he orchestrates completely. He's crowned on April, on Easter Sunday. He enters purposely on Good Friday. 
April 6th. What is this setup? You enter Rome on April 6th and you're crowned on April 8th. What's Good Friday represent? Death of Christ, Sunday, resurrection, rebirth of classical antiquity at the same time that you're rebirth in a Christian mode. So you're, you're incorporating both of these ideas, rebirth of pagan and the notion, notion of rebirth of Christianity at the same time. 1343, his brother Gerardo becomes a Carthusian monk. That's a big change. His brother was, was with him in Bologna, and the two of them were spending most of their time writing poetry, flirting, doing all kinds of things. His brother able to make a huge step and become a Carthusian monk. That is a very incredibly intense order. Anybody know anything about the Carthusians? They take an absolute vow of silence. So on one side, you've got Petra, who can't shut up. <laughs> and his brother. <laughs> His brother takes a vow of silence. That's a very important day, 1343. 1345, he discovers in Verona letters by Cicero. Nobody noticed and nobody has seen, and they've been lost. These letters uh, to Atticus and Brutus and others. And that inspires him to create his own collection of letters. And he begins his letter correction in earnest in 1359, and eventually produces just volumes and volumes of ordered letters. Now, one of the things that's very important to bear in mind, you get this idea, everything Petrarch did, I have a feeling sometimes in my worst fantasy, even when, when you know, going to the bathroom, it's sort of modeled on the classics. What did they do? You know? How did Cicero do it? How did Petrarch, how did, how did, uh, how did uh, Salus do it? How did anybody in Homer do it? He decides he's going to be just like that. But he's got to do it in his own mode, right? Well, what happens if you are I don't know how old he is now. He's in his 40s, right? 41, and then he's in his 50s. And you sort of like, somebody say, oh my god, I want to have a letter collection too, just like him. But you're missing a lot of letters. What do you do from your, from your youth? You, you, make you make a lot. Brilliant. You make a lot. Brilliant, isn't it? It's sort of like if you go to the Harry Ransom Center, you can find uh, the Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, but it's not the real manuscript of the Wasteland of T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot later in life discovered that he could get money after the fact from manuscripts. So he would write out the Wasteland, make all kinds of markings on it, and sell them posthumously I mean, you know, after the fact of having written it. And so we have these sort of after the fact sort of versions of the Wasteland. Um, just money making. Well, anyway, this isn't quite like that, but it is this understanding of just sort of, I have to construct myself. The letter of momentum, if you look at it closely, you will see that that letter could not have been written, as he says on the spur of the moment in 1336. It probably wasn't even written in 1345. It was probably written way later in the 1350s when he was an old man. And he realized, you know, I need to have this wonderful letter to articulate who I am. Because I've written all these great letters later in my life. Gosh, I've got to have some really weighty, important letters earlier in my life. So one of the things that I think is very important is that Petrarch is setting himself up as an example, as somebody to be imitated, as somebody to be rivaled, but somebody that he really doesn't think anybody's ever going to surpass. People do surpass him in a certain way. But nonetheless, he might. The second thing that's very important is he starts outside the academy, outside the academic world. I think this is an important feature, if you think about this. Uh, by having himself crowned on the Capitoline, he's purposely separating himself off from the university, which was associated with a certain mode of thinking. It's all scholasticism. Scholasticism was a certain mode of thinking, very important mode of thinking at the same time, which in a sense was fed legal and medical culture at the time. He doesn't want anything to do with that. What he wants is classical rhetoric, classical poetry, moral philosophy, literature, and I don't know, uh, history, right? The last thing he wants is theology in the sort of the pure, hard sort of science of it uh, of the time. He wants to moralize. Now, a couple of things that are very important about Petrarch, when you get to that letter, you'll find him talking about reading texts. One of the things that you find at the beginning of the Italian Renaissance, starting with Petrarch, but then flourishes in the 15th century and eventually becomes very extremely important as science in the 16th century, is what we might call philology. Philology is really the study of language, right? But really what philology at this point was, was you have all these different manuscripts of, let's say, Livy. This is a perfect example. Petrarch has a copy of Livy, <coughs> uh, History of Rome. Problem is, you've got multiple copies of this. Which is the right version? Mm. Right? 
all this stuff. We have multiple copies of Hamlet, multiple folios. We don't have the originals, obviously. Which is the right one? Um, is it fair as foul, foul as fair, or is it something else? You know, fish is foul, foul as fish. I don't know. But the point is, they find all these different versions of things, and you have to settle on which is the best one, which is the oldest one, which is the most authentic. If you look at classical text today, it's critical editions, at the bottom of it, there will be this apparatus showing you all the different kinds of versions of it. Certainly the end of, 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 of something <clears throat> such as... Um, uh, such as uh, uh, Shakespeare's work, but much more so in the classical period. Petrarch is the first person in a way who's coming along and saying, hmm, I want to study these things because I want to know what they originally said. I want, I want to get close as possible to the source, as if you were sort of touching the hand that actually composed these works or painted those paintings. Or something of that sort. This is very important because it's the beginning of a kind of historicizing of language <coughs> and of historical thinking at the same time. There's a difference between me and them, between where I stand and where they stand. Or think of it in terms of 15th century visual terms, perspective. What is perspective? Perspective puts things in the pictorial space, right? But it also puts you in a definitive relationship to those things in space. What Petrarch does with language, they are doing with visually with, with, with perspective. He's separating himself off from that classical period and he's identifying those people as living and embedded in a particular moment in time. So those are a couple of things I just wanted to articulate about this man. Now, there's the next person I want to show you is uh, Castiglione. Uh, he's, this is the height of the Italian Renaissance. This is one of those little towns. It's a dukedom. It's called, uh, um, it's called Urbino, which means little city. And he describes a conversation that takes place over four days uh, in 1507, among a, n a number of courtiers, he's modeling this off of Cicero's great work on the order, how to create the perfect orator, and they all decide that collectively together they are going to uh, describe the perfect uh, courtier. Now, in the process of doing so, I've given you this material in your packet so you can look at it. He comes up with four words, how to create the perfect courtier. And these are four terms I want to just go through quickly, and then we'll sort of open it up to uh, discussion about the... The packet he's talking about is on the wiki page. So oh, the wiki page, I'm sorry. Four terms. <coughs> Grazio, or grace, the best translation. Volgitizio, good judgment. Sprezzatura is a neologism. And affectazione, which means affectation. I'm just going to kind of go through this. What does it mean to be a great courtier, he says? Well, some people, he says, well, to be a great courtier, what you need is grace. You need grazia. When you think of the word grace, what do you think of? Typically, in theological terms, what would you think of? Blessing. Blessings, grace, something that's bestowed vertically on high, something that you get. You have some direct pipeline with, with, with God. Dante, in the beginning of the, uh, of the Divine Comedy, is, is the grace is bestowed on him vertically to allow him to travel on this journey. But the grace he's thinking of is something quite different. There's a couple of qualities. Grace might be just a quality of being. Your ability to <coughs> act in a suave manner. But what he's really thinking about is another kind of grace, which is sort of the notion of gratuity, right? Or to ingratiate yourself to somebody. What he wants, you need grace, because what you want is the favor of the patron. This is this whole patronage system that Petrarch was wonderful at, right? How to be suave, how to be smooth. So you need this certain quality of grace, a certain quality of being, but how do you get it? If it's not just bestowed on you, if you're not born with it, how do you acquire grace? Well, the first thing he says, uh, leaving aside Bon Giudizio for a moment, is you need something which is called sprezzatura. And sprezzatura is a complex term. Basically, let's think of it in this way. The worst thing you want, he says, is to be affected. Affectazione. Affected means what? What would that mean? Somebody's affected. What's that? Put on airs, okay? Exaggerating things. When my daughter uh, had her junior year abroad and she went to London for that year, my brother turned to me and said, oh God, don't come back with a British accent pretending you're something you're not, right? I mean, sort of, you can tell when somebody's, um, that there's a kind of an artifice to it. You could tell that it's not completely natural, right? So they're working too hard, right? Um, and you can tell through that sort of sense of affectation that there's a lot of effort that's going into it. Now, sprezzatura is a term that he coins that everybody needs to have, and I've given you this in this wiki 
wiki pad, a wiki something or other, <laughs> right, material. Um, he says you need spasatura. This is important because it is underpins, it seems to me, a great deal of not just the Italian Renaissance, <coughs> but to be sure, uh, the Renaissance generally, even the European Renaissance. This was the most important book written in the Italian Renaissance, the most important prose work, and arguably in Europe as well. I mean, everybody knew it. Uh, it was translated into English immediately. So spettatura is a funny term. It means effectively to despise, to devalue, to take off a little bit. And what he's got is this idea, in a sense, that in the world, he's borrowing from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, what is virtue? Virtue, for Aristotle, is the mean between extremes, right? So on one side, uh, let's see, what is, what is courage? Well, on one side, you have somebody who is foolhardy, and on the other side, you have somebody who's a coward. Courage is somewhere right smack in between. But one of the problems is, how do you know what is the exact middle between extremes? And what he's sort of suggesting is, at any given moment, take off a bit, shave off a bit, just reduce it a slight amount. So if you're not so sure how fast to walk or how slow to walk, <coughs> walk just a little slower than you think a normal pace would be. In fact, at one point he says, how tall should the perfect courtier be? Exact middle height. But better a little shorter than taller, right? If you're, if you're uncertain, how long should your beard be? Well, perfect size, but just a little shorter than longer if you're not sure. So what should the temperament of a, what should the emotional temperament of a courtier be? Well, you don't want it to be too hot-headed, right? You don't want to be hot and inflamed and, and irascible, and quick to action, or to, too effusive, or sympathetic, or emotional, bursting into tears of screaming. On the other side, you don't want them to be indifferent, and cold, and all the rest of it. You want them to be perfectly warm. But if you're not sure what warm is, you've got to be cool. That's it. Spreads it toward us how to be cool. It's the art, really, already, before the 1950s, of being absolutely suave and cool. And this is the important part because you are never supposed to show the sweat. So you have to work hard. You have to study hard. You have to work hard to be a, a, a courtier doing all these different things that he tells you how to do. You have to know how to dance, how to play music and do all these things. But you really never want to show the work at all. It's the art of hiding art. Now, the two things about <laughs> at the same time. One thing is to be the perfect courtier. The other reason to have this art of sprezzatura, this art of hiding art, is because you can identify yourself among these other courtiers. And effectively, it's a signaling device. It's like a magic trick, in a certain sense. I, I know, as a courtier, that you've put a lot of work into it. Because I know what it takes to be a courtier. So I can see that that person has worked hard at being cool. I don't see the sweat. I don't see the label. But I can recognize that person as one of my own. If you look at that person, you think that person's a natural, that that person just is born being cool, then you've been taken in by the illusion. So in a certain sense, it's a trick of the trade whereby these courtiers can recognize <coughs> each other as one of their own. And it's a kind of professional device for creating it. So one of the things that we're talking about is Sprezzatura is an art. They're obsessed in the Italian Renaissance and later with constructing arts of everything, how to paint, how to be a courtier, how to behave in public. There's an art of conversation. There is an art of comportment. A famous book by De La Casa. Yes, go ahead. So question. Political correctness. Poli well, political correctness is very different in the sense when you think of political correctness, what comes to mind? To say the right thing, to do the right thing. Yeah. Um, but it's very conscious, isn't it? I mean, we know when somebody's being really politically correct. Try not to offend anybody. Try, that's, that's, that's key for manners and things like that for someone like Galateo, um, for De La Casa. But if you think about it, well, let me put it this way. Who, for you, is cool right now in the world? It reminds me of that beer commercial, the coolest man on the earth. Or OK, but is he cool? I don't know. He's but I mean, just look at the ad for a moment. Is that guy cool? Think about it. 
He makes us think he Yeah, he makes you think of you, but, but the fact that you have to think about it doesn't make him look so cool. Doesn't he seem a little affected? Yes, sir, I am. Mean. <laughs> right? Let me, let me show you, let me give you a spoof on what it means to be cool. This is a fun spoof on it. Um, uh, let's go to this one for a moment. Um, I hope it comes out. Oops, maybe, maybe select on select PC. This is it. This is I, I want to pick this one. I hope the volume works. <laughs> this clip is presented by all new Studio <coughs> Forrester. Hello, I'm Barack Obama. The past few weeks, my transition team and I have been in Chicago, laying the groundwork for my presidency. One thing has become clear. No matter the circumstances, I am going to keep it cool. Examples? Let's take Hillary Clinton. You remember her. She ran against me in the Democratic primary told superdelegates I couldn't win in a general election. Hey, she brought up William Ayers before anyone. Did I exact political revenge? Nope. I brought her in. Why? Because I keep it cool. <laughs> I take my kids to school. I don't lose my temper. It's my only way. I keep it cool. <laughs> what about Joel Weaver? There's a character. Supported John McCain. He even spoke at the Republican convention. So what did I do with Joe Lieberman? Did I strip him of his chairmanship, make him a pariah in his own party? No, sir. I said, let's keep Joe close. Why? Because if given a choice, I choose cool. <laughs> and then there's John McCain. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Would have been easy to turn my back on John McCain, but I didn't. I sat down with him and we announced we were going to work together to take on the critical challenges facing this nation. So why did I do it? I think you know the answer to that. I keep it cool. I never play the fool to my politics as usual. I keep it cool. When I accomplish a mission, if there isn't going to be a banner, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> So, I think you got the idea, but obviously he's affected there, right? It's Miles Davis, the whole thing, it's too conscious. So a spoof, of course, is going to exaggerate certain qualities. But if you're watching tennis, I mean, uh, Federer is the quintessential, and he never sweats, and get it. You've got all these people running around the court. He looks as if he was born doing this. The whole point is it's an art, but you have to hide the fact that it's an art. So everybody thinks that it's natural. But it really is, in Erasmus's terms, people are made, not born. They are really constructed. This is the same idea of Petrarch constructing his identity, fashioning in such a way that everybody wants to be near him. Think he's the greatest person in the world. Will you come here? Will you be my patron? There's a wonderful example of Boccaccio trying to do the same. He goes out to Naples and tries to, he fails at it miserably. Nobody can see him to do it. Did you have a question or you're sort of? No. Just a thought. Yeah. But no, no, please. Um, I think that's there's a, a little bit of a rebirth of the cool thing. We kind of went through that in the late 50s, 60s, and the 70s. It began to be more about showing the weakness in yourself, showing the feelings. And now my son and his wife are both in law school, and they were telling us this weekend about the things that they taught. And it's like if you're if you're boss at the law firm comes to you and says, you've got to do this, 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 and this, and I need it yesterday, you're like, no sweat, I got it. And then you go back to your office and you can go, ah, crazy, but no sweat. It's all hidden. And, and it's, but it seems like it's coming around, away from that empathy thing to, mm -hmm. I got it. Just under control. Absolutely. Yeah. You're multitasking, whatever the term would be, and you're doing all these different things, but you don't look frazzled. It's just sort of, yeah, it's just... It just happens. I don't know how it gets done, but it just does, right? I mean, try and stand and look cool. It's very difficult to be self-conscious and cool at the same time, but that's what they're doing, right? It's a supremely self-conscious act. So when Petrarch gets up there and he's orchestrating this, and he's acting as if 
these degrees were conferred upon him rather than him orchestrating it behind the scenes so that people would offer it and lo and behold it arrives miraculously on the same day. We know it's all put together. When he climbs him up Mont Ventoux and he gets to the top and he opens, by chance he happens to have St. Augustine's Confessions with it and he reads the exact passage that's meaningful to him and he converts precisely at the top of the mountain and exactly, I mean, all these imitative processes, it looks so natural. But in point of fact, we know that it's completely confected, something that's been constructed. And the question that rises is, well, who is the real Petrarch? That is to say, we know more about him than anybody else. He's written more. But can we trust anything that he says? Because it's always projecting certain representations and images of himself. We can see where this leads to. Someone like Machiavelli. What is the prince? The prince is is somebody who terrorizes his subjects at one point, because he loved it. We don't know who the prince is. All we know is he is manipulating our impression of who the prince is. We can see where it leads with Shakespeare, figures like Iago. Who is Hamlet? The wonderful question, Hamlet. Let's start with Hamlet for a moment. What are the first words of Hamlet? Some of you may know. What are the first two words of Hamlet? There's guards outside, it's dark, it's cold, and there's mist. And you hear one of the guards cry out, Who's there? That's it. That's the entire Renaissance in a nutshell. It's a sort of an elaborate knock-knock game in which you're asking, who's there? Who is Yago? Who is Hamlet? And there's these inherent mysteries to these people. Is there something natural to this person that makes Hamlet Hamlet? Or is it something that's just been artfully constructed as he sort of works this up about himself, or Othello, or Desdemona, or any of these characters? Who are these things? They invite you to think that there's some essential quality, but maybe it's always just some projection representation of themselves. And they start to very consciously do this in the Italian Renaissance in a way that you just simply cannot imagine. And they're very conscious about doing it. That is to say, they talk over and over again about an art. This starts to take place, I, I know a lot about this because I've been writing a new book on this one, but anyway, the art of the Italian Renaissance, the whole notion of of articulating through how-to books, how to do anything, emerges in the Italian Renaissance. So much so, let me give you the first great etiquette manuals. How to behave in polite society. What do you do? Do you blow your nose? How do you blow your nose? Do you blow your nose, De La Casa says. You do it, do you show everybody it? As if you have, he says, jewels in your handkerchief to show everybody else. No, you don't do that. When you go to the bathroom, do you come out Drying your hands like this? No, because that will, you know, that will create in the fantasy of others something about what you've just done, which is unseemly. All kinds of things. You sort of say to yourself, well, didn't people know this? No, they did not. They really didn't. Think about the amount of filth in the Middle Ages. They start talking about cleanliness for the first time, really obsessively. I know I've written a whole book on this. In the Italian Renaissance. They, now, whether they were cleaner than others, I do not know. But they talk about it, and cleanliness is about politeness, it's about <coughs> peace, it's about boundaries, it's about controlling all kinds of things, both physical boundaries, what's coming out of my body, and also what's coming out of my town, what's coming out of my country, what's coming out of my mouth, verbally, right? I mean, just beforehand, or my, my staff are saying, you know, you know, can't use those words. Uh, you're in polite company, right? The whole point is, there's a certain way of behaving here. I behave differently when I went with the dean, as opposed to when I'm with my friends, all that kind of confecting and consciousness of one moving between, that's very much a Renaissance notion that has to take place in the court. Think about Yago, think of all these people who know how to play the game. Knowing how to play the game is, so you have all these books start coming out. How to be a painter, how to be a this, how to be a servant, how to be a cook, how to be a cardinal, how to be a secretary. Secretary, very important position, a secretary was the keeper of secrets. How to be the courtier. And the first great book of this was Cortigiano, How to Become the Perfect Courtier. And then all of a sudden, boom, there are tons of it. But even beforehand, Bazzari is writing how to be a painter, an architect, uh, just an endless proliferate. How to be a soldier. You can imagine how many books on dueling. Everything is reduced to an art. And this is very important. There's the idea in the Italian Renaissance that you can really shape who you are. Hence, humanism is an educational program. It first starts as an <laughs> educational program, but it's an educational and cultural program. That is to say, our entire principle of the humanities, to a certain degree, which grows out in a very distant way from, 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 from humanism in the past, is this notion that we can educate people. 
And the humanists were educators of what? They were teachers, but they were teachers of who? Young boys. Little, little people, right? Shaping them into princes so that they will become eventually good enlightened rulers. Most of them were just absolutely despicable. That's possible. That's another story. There's a question back there, yeah. Uh, were all these books that were like the, the how-tos, yeah. I guess the modern day equivalent is like art for dummies? Well, you just go to, well, when there used to be bookstores, physical bookstores, you would go to them and you would go down aisle after aisle and take over the literature, <coughs> classical literature or anything. How-to, how to do anything? How to get a job? They have, there's a book by Rudolf Bell called How To Books in the Renaissance. And he talks, in, in this instance, he's not talking about the kinds of things I am, but he's talking about how to raise a child. How do you do that? I mean, think about it. My parents read Dr. Spock. Now we read all kinds of other stuff. I mean, when, I, when, my, when we first had a child, it was like, oh my god, what do you do with this thing? <laughs> right? Um, it weighs like a meatloaf, but you got to treat it differently. Yeah. <laughs> I just have a question because I was just thinking as you were talking, um, you know, ways to relate it to our kids. Are you familiar with the Diary of a Wimpy Kid books? Like, no. Okay. There's this kid who writes this thing, and it's basically he's going into middle school, and it's all about sixth grade and how he needs to change his persona so that he can be not a dork, right? right. So, would you consider that to be like an okay? I mean, Ways maybe related to the case. That's quintessential. I mean, you can relate this to uh, Mad Men, Don Draper, for all you know, right? I mean, here's somebody who, any kind of reconstructing, self consciously constructing your identity so you are perceived in a certain way, and your ability to manipulate that is a quintessential that just gets played out in the high Renaissance. I mean, so one of the key things about Spinozzatura is you're supposed to look, right, just a little bit. Cool. Just a little bit suave and you take things off. Now, which of these people look like the perfect courtier to you? B. Which one would look better to you as a perfect courtier? A or B? A. B. B. B is trying to be. If you're going for cool, it's A. If you're going for cool, it's got to be A, right? Well, well what's the matter with B? Trying to look like yeah. He looks like he's working hard at it, right? And you look at that pose. I can't do it, but you know, I'm not thin enough, and, and all the dress and all the other stuff, you know, is so incredibly stylized, right? It's really, you're conscious of him being in a pose. Now, you're conscious of the other one being in a pose, yes? It's what, you know, the, what you're saying about being cool, he's trying too hard. He's trying too hard. You can see the art. You can see the artistry in this. Now, you can see the art in this up to a point, but not so much. I mean, look at the hats, for example. Now, who do you think that person is, hey? It's Castiglione, it's the author of the Cortigiano. And he had this made for his wife, actually, so that when she's gone, in his absence, it was made by none other than, oops, bad picture. <laughs> we'll go back to this one, by Raphael Sanzio, who is known, Vasari describes Raphael as the painter <coughs> of grace, and he was the, also the painter with grace. That so it just seems so natural. If you think of Michelangelo, you've got these twisting bodies, these muscular women about who's, you know, they're all men that just sort of lop breasts on. Or place breasts, not lop. Um, um, no, not. So anyway, um, or on the other side, Leonardo, where everything's a little bit too effeminate and things of this sort. And just, just, he's the perfect balance, Raphael. In fact, if you look at the, the iconic image of the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, the figure of Christ is often seen as modeled on the visually the figure of, Le, of Raphael himself because he epitomized Christ. So it's not only his suavity, not only is Christ um, suave in Leonardo's painting, forget also everything Dan Brown has to say, but leaving that aside, not, but he's, he's a representation itself of that kind of, not vertical race that you associate with Christ, but the kind of suavity of, 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 of being cool at the same time. Well, Kassin, notice something about this. First of all, if you're the beholder, let's look at this image for a moment. I wrap that Very, very important in a lot of ways. First of all, he's wearing a hat. Why is he wearing a hat? He's bald! <laughs> if you're bald, it's not good. You've got to have some hair. Maybe not too much. Right? Take off a little. But if you're bald, you've got to hide it in some way. So you've got to hide it in a suave way. Nobody's going to notice that. I suppose if you wake up in the morning, you go to breakfast, and you're wearing a hat, people say, what's the hat? But nonetheless, if you're in polite company, you wear the hat. The beard. I think that's always rather fascinating, because only in the 16th century did they start wearing beards. I could go on and on about that. 
written a whole lot of stuff on. But anyway, he's wearing a beard, but it's not too long. It's not too short. It's not this kind of, you know, sort of slight growth that, that's become fashionable in the last decade. But it's certainly not like um, 1960s, right? Like the musical hair, where everything was just kind of scraggly and good. It's, it's, it's nicely coiffed. It's fashionable, right? Other thing about his pose, it's not exaggerated. It's a slight three-quarter. It starts to invent in, in that period. <laughs> also, what do you think he's doing? Let's go back to the first image, actually, I had um, up. What do you think he's doing? What about his mouth? What does that suggest in his eyes? His posture. Where is he in relationship to you? Is he above? Is he below? Or is he at the same level? Same level. Same level. Very important. Imagine this is something that he wants to do. What does Grace and Sprezzatura do with the prince? It levels out the playing field. Right? It, you need me the way I need you. I'm here for you. Um, so one of the things is, is, is it looks as if he's about to speak. He's in a conversation. It's an essential aspect of the Italian Renaissance as they're talking about. You are in a conversation with other people, with the classical past, with your patron, with your friends, whatever it happens to be. And he's engaging. So he, he made this painting. It was the first prince. It was for his wife. But he basically said, well, I'm gone. I know I'm going to be gone a lot. He was a diplomat and all kinds of other things. He basically said in so many words, um, you can have a conversation with this. Pretend it's me in my absence. And what's important about it, I think, is this notion that he's giving you a kind of a suave, unstudied, but nonetheless so hyper-studied representation of himself. It is really, now this is another painting by, oh, God, I hate it when this happens. <laughs> uh, let me try a different way of doing this. Uh, let me see if I can do it this way. Like this. And slideshow. That's as good as we're going to get at the moment. OK, this is for, uh, 1506. It's a portrait <coughs> by Madeleine by Raphael. Now, um, parts of it are missing, unfortunately. The hands would be down. That's why we, you know, we propose like this. But a couple of things. What would you notice about her that might, you know, suggest that uh, that makes uh, Raphael the painter of sort of grazia, of suavity, as he's representing her? Talk to me a little bit about what you see. The flyaways. What's that? The flyaway hair. The flyaway hair. What's the little pieces that are coming out? That it's way? the little pieces that are coming off, right? If your hair is too perfect, too tucked away. Then it just looks as if it's, it's too perfect. There has to be this slight blemish or this slight thing that devalues it in a way that makes it look ever so natural. But what do we know? What do we absolutely know must have happened in this occasion? He must have gone out and just taken little wisps, or he just paints them in. It doesn't really matter. In order to give us the illusion of something being ever so suave. 